This evening, I want to talk really the only Dharma talk I have left after all these years, thinking of more and more and more topics, but the older I get, the less and less I have to talk about, and there is really only one topic remaining, and that is what I would call the mystic path, that is Buddhism and other enlightenment traditions are geared towards, they revolve around and they point to this process of gaining enlightenment, whatever enlightenment is. And that's our job. Now, there are cultural aspects to Buddhism, there are scholarly aspects to Buddhism, but really the original suttas are all geared towards this one particular path. I want to lay it out from beginning to midpoint, not going all the way to the end because I haven't got there yet, but I can point to you quite clearly some people in this world will have an interest in this kind of practice. Many people won't. If you've noticed, near my temple, Wapak Nam, they have a, I don't know what it's called, something like jazz aerobics. There's a couple of women who have a stage and they dance to music in certain moves and then people come and exercise along with them. That's quite popular. There's always like 60 or 70 people come for a little jazz aerobics. But talk about enlightenment, there's not so many people interested. So for some of us, I, I do fully understand that, that this particular path is not for everybody. There was one time the Buddha supposedly went up to one of the heavenly realms. He was asked by Saka, the king of the gods, to why do people not understand the practice. He said, desire, I'm putting an end to desire. When some people hear about this, their hearts do not respond. And then he said to the king of the gods, desire is led by thinking. When the thinking stops, the desire will surely stop too, which is interesting. I'm just going to leave that with you. See if you desire things without thinking about them. Can you do it? Can you desire something without thinking about it? If I put some nice, nice loaf of bread in front of you here, that's what gets me. I don't know. Maybe you guys, you're all lay people, so you can have bread and things, but a nice iPhone. Can you have desire come up without thinking about it? Experiment, see what happens. So this practice is one of withdrawing or extracting the mind from maya, delusion. This concept that the world is delusionary or illusionary. It's not that the world doesn't exist, it's that we have misunderstood the world. That's why it's delusion and not illusion. So the world is really there, but we have become deluded about it and withdrawing our mind from this and entering into the light of awareness and enlightenment is our job. So what does this mean? We carry around with us a set of stories. I like to use the word stories. We can use the word concepts. If you are a psychologist, you might use the word constructs. What it means is these stories we carry around, that this is our way of understanding the world. The world is too complicated to understand in totality. So we have these small stories that help us and guide our behavior and our understanding. Don't know if you know the science populist Carl Sagan. Yeah, I used to worship Carl Sagan until many years later when I found out just how wrong he was about so many things. He wrote this very good article about a grain of salt. 
and how many atoms there are in a grain of salt and the spatial arrangement between the grains, between the atoms and molecules in the salt. And then he compared it to the human brain, how many synapses we have, how much information we can process. And he came to the conclusion, the human mind is unable to comprehend a grain of salt in its entirety. What we can understand is a pattern. So we can understand salt is sodium and chlorine, right? So we can understand is sodium and chlorine arranged in a kind of lattice network. So we can understand this grain of salt in general. We can have a story about it. That's how we understand the world. It's too complicated, even just yourself or your friends or your partners or society or Thai visa rules. They're too complicated for a human being to possibly comprehend. So we have stories that that uh, give us rules of thumb, ways to understand people and the world. Uh, very Sometimes very simple stories, sometimes very complicated stories. Another way to think about it is models. We have models for how the world is. My favorite models, here's one, to understand people. Of course, you can't understand even one person, but you can have a story. So to understand people, there are two kinds of people in this world. Those who can extrapolate from incomplete data. Come on, nobody get that joke. <laughs> there are two kinds of people in this world and you should avoid both of them. <laughs> so we think that we have these little stories of ways that we, we understand the world, and then you don't realize that you carry this conceptual framework around with you. And in psychology, this is called personal construct theory, was popularized by uh, George Kelly. Kelly said that you carry these, what he called personal constructs around with you. And so long as your stories, your constructs can explain the world and what you are experiencing, you are reasonably happy and content. But when your stories break down, or when they are challenged, you start to suffer a little bit. I noticed this. I just was in Canada, and I went for a nice walk to the park, and I have to cross some kind of busy highways with some slip roads coming in and out. And as I was going out onto the slip road, I looked right, Nothing, no cars coming, and I just and I walked out. I forgot Canada. The cars come from the left, so yeah, I nearly got boned down. But I don't even know I have that construct that you look right for oncoming traffic, and I have to change it to look left. I don't even know I carry that construct around with me, but that's a story that I have: conceptual framework, story, construct. However, you want to think about it. When your constructs don't work, then you feel suffering, or when they are challenged, you feel agitated. Sometimes I like to do this. I deliberately throw things at people just to agitate them. I say things like, global warming is complete nonsense. How do you feel? Do you feel agitated? So I, I had a room of people in Canada, and I said, this global warming is complete nonsense. And I played a clip of Al Gore, 2007. He said in his Nobel Prize winning acceptance speech, he said, just think of it. Scientists tell us in as little as seven years, North Pole ice cap will be gone in summer months. As little as seven years. Now, you notice he used the word could. And whenever you have the word could, you can replace that sentence with the words could not, and it's equally true. It could be gone in seven years. It could also not be gone in seven years. So I pulled the data up. Uh, July 2007, when he gave the speech, the North Pole ice cap was, I think, 8.7 million square miles. And the figure for this July 
and it was 8.8 .8 million square miles. There's no change. This data is freely available. So now, how do you feel? Have we challenged your construct? Do you not care? We all know the ice cap isn't going to melt, really, don't we? Do we? I like doing political ones, but we get on dodgy ground. Why did Joe Biden blow up Russia's gas pipeline? So when you hear something that, that doesn't agree with your preconceptions, your stories, you feel agitated. So we carry these stories around and this make up our conceptual universe, stories about our health and our diet and people and politics and society and the future and the past and who we are and what we are and what we are supposed to do. And that is where most people will live their lives in this conceptual world. When nothing's challenging it, you feel fairly peaceful. When something is challenging it, you feel more agitated. You want to try to explain away the things that challenge your framework. These concepts that we carry around include religious concepts, includes Buddhism. All of Buddhism can fit. They're just more concepts. You can rearrange your concepts to change the world that you live in. You can switch out your bad concepts for better concepts, concepts or stories of revenge that you're going to get against Thai immigration or whoever it is that you're, you're disliking. And you can replace it with concepts of forgiveness and joy. There are a lot of things in my mind right now. I have to be careful sometimes. So you can change your concepts. You can re reconstruct your world in a better way, but you're still moving deck chairs around on the Titanic. You're still just changing one set of concepts for another set of concepts. Even Buddhism is another set of concepts. We may put it against Christianity, or we may put Hinayana Buddhism against Mahayana Buddhism, or my teacher against that other teacher. This happens a lot. <laughs> one time, a first couple of years when I came to Thailand and I went to an event in the World Fellowship of Buddhists, where some of us used to go years ago. And I went there to an event and there was a Thai monk there. He said, oh, it's so nice to see a foreigner come and ordain in Thailand. I'm so happy, really glad that you would come and become a monk in, in Thailand and learn Buddhism. He said, what temple do you live at? I said, oh, I'm at Wat Bak Nam. He said, oh, oh, well, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Because his temple is the right temple and my temple is the wrong temple, obviously. So even Buddhism is another set of concepts. This is Maya. This is what was called Maya, M-A-Y-A, or delusion. The delusionary world that we live in doesn't mean it's illusion. The concepts are important. We have to get by in the world. We have to have some kind of framework of understanding to guide behavior. But... The path, the mystic path, is to step out of this conceptual world that we live in. So the first step that we can take out of the conceptual world is to bring attention into raw experience. If we bring attention to raw experience, we've dropped this conceptual. It's still there, but we're have withdrawn from it and now are just in straightforward experiencing. For example, you can put the attention onto the breath, just the in-breath and the out-breath. Feel it, just raw. You don't need concepts. You don't need to think about the breath or determine what is the breath called in Sanskrit or should I have long breath or short breath or breath at the belly or breath at the nose. You can just put attention onto breathing and it's raw and it's present and it's here. A lot of our practices are like that. So you can put attention onto eating. Monks do this, it's listed in the suttas. We have a lot of rules about eating and how we eat. Not allowed to scrape our spoon on the side of the bowl. It's funny when I eat with lay people and you get your ice cream bowl and 
to get that last little bit from around it. And it's, no, oh, you can't do that. You're supposed to eat one mouthful and then stop and not prepare the next mouthful until you finish this one. And then we have a lot of these rules that you probably don't know about just as well, because you'd be thinking that monk's no good. Look at him. He's prepared his next spoonful before he's finished his current spoonful. It's raw experiencing walking meditation. You feel the feet on the ground, just raw experience. And it's quite beautiful and it's quite peaceful. It's quite serene because the human mind doesn't like to be there normally. Normally you like to be in your conceptual world manipulating your concepts, rearranging your deck chairs, figuring out who to vote for in the next election, figuring out which country to go and retire in, figuring out if Manchester United is going to win the World Cup. People ask me about football because I'm from Manchester. Uh, yeah, I don't care. Someone said to me, where are you from? I said, I'm, uh, oh, I'm from near Manchester. He said, what? Well, Manchester United or Manchester City? I said, oh, Manchester United. Manchester City is in Glasgow. <laughs> Isn't it? <laughs> I played him along for about 10 minutes and this kind of stuff, just for my own vicious amusement. So what happens when you sit and meditate? Your mind wants to go back into the conceptual world, right? You sit, you start thinking. If you're reasonably comfortable, the temperature's okay, nobody's bothering you, I'm going to watch the breath, in breath, out breath, and then an idea comes up and you're gone. Is that your experience? That's the conceptual world of maya, illusion, that you have to withdraw from. It's a little disturbing because it's very comfortable in there, especially if you can arrange your concepts in a reasonable way, if you're reasonably sane and together as a human being, that's a really comfortable place to be. It's just in uh, Canada and there's a number of students that kept talking to me about being triggered by things. It's a bit strange. I've never really understood that this was actually a way that people have of thinking, that they have a right to live happily and at ease and for nothing to come and trigger. And trigger what? For a trigger, you have to have a loaded gun. What's your loaded gun that you're carrying around? It's these stories. So you say Donald Trump to someone and triggered. I, I don't like him or I do like him. I want to make America great again. Somebody parked their car outside the center and there's somebody in the center who had problems with the guy who parked his car. Anyway, he lost his keys. So the car was parked there for several weeks. Anyway, she wouldn't come into the temple because she gets triggered by the car. I was trying to say, you don't get triggered by things you, unless you're carrying it around with you. These, this is your conceptual world, your ideas you're carrying around with you. And when they get challenged, you don't like it. So we learn to withdraw, extract out from that conceptual universe. It's really important because Buddhism also is another set of constructs, is another set of stories that infiltrate into that conceptual world and seem to say, hey, you know, there's actually a way out. I think of it like a computer game. And then somewhere while you're in the computer game, there's a little character comes on screen that says, turn off your computer. How do I do that? I don't know how to do that. Where's the computer? And you're looking around in the game for the computer to turn off. It's what we're doing so much of the time with Buddhist practice. We're not withdrawing from this conceptual world. We're looking to go into another concept, looking to hold another better concept, unable to escape from the game. There's a program called Red Dwarf. Anybody seen Red Dwarf? And <laughs> uh, they had a game called Better Than Life, and you put these electrodes on and you're in the computer game. And it looks at your thoughts and it constructs a world for you that's better than real life. And this game is deadly because once you're in it, nobody wants to come out. And eventually the guy, Dave Lister, was in it. And eventually he comes out and he escapes the game. 
and he's oh he's back on the spaceship and he's happy and it's all nice and he makes himself some toast and then he accidentally knocks the toast onto the floor and it lands butter side up it's like wait the toast never lands butter side up so he makes 50 pieces of toast and knocks them all onto the floor and they all land butter side up and he realized he's still in the game he's constructing a better universe for him honestly that's how it is with we're trying to put these concepts up to fight against the other concepts to rearrange the conceptual world. We have to step out. So coming into raw experiencing is the first step because you're leaving the conceptual world where it is. You don't have to fix it. You don't have to change it. You don't have to have the right concepts. You just start to get used to the feeling of yourself when you're not lost in the conceptual world, in Maya delusion. So raw experience is very good. Feeling the feeling onto your feet, eating the food, watching the breath. But even these, after a while, you start to realize all you've done is you focused attention onto this now, instead of the thinking. So it starts to dawn on you that focusing on some particular object is still just holding the mind in a certain place. It's still not liberation. So the next step from raw experiencing is to see the actual nature of the mind. Seeing this, what happens? The mind moves from one thing to another thing, to another thing, to another thing. One thing at a time. You might feel like the car is always parked outside. You may feel like Thai immigration office is always there in Jing Watana. And objectively, it is. If you want to build a bridge or get a visa, you have to think in that way. But raw experiencing, seeing the own mind shows one thing comes up into attention. Then it dissipates and leaves attention. We go into pure phenomenology in philosophical terms, which means the thing that's real is the thing that you are perceiving at that moment. One perception arises for a few seconds, drops another perception, arises, drops another perception. And to a meditator, you should at some point start to see this, that while you are sitting, say, okay, I'm going to watch the in-breath, I'm going to watch the out-breath, I'm going to watch the in-breath, I'm going to watch Game of Thrones. <laughs> I'm going to have something to eat on the way home. I'm going to watch my in-breath. I can hear the person next to me coughing. I'm going to watch, and then I can feel the air conditioner. And, oh, that's right, I have to get the engineers out to fix my air conditioner. And I think I'll call them tomorrow. And the mind is moving from one thing to another thing, to another thing, to another thing. You might feel like your mind is out of control. You may feel like you have a monkey mind. This is actually what the mind is all of the time. You just don't notice it. The conceptual world, the stories, they try to bring order out of chaos. Our path is going into that chaos. This was not what the Buddha described as someone who has too much thinking. This is how he described all consciousness. And if you start to see that, you're heading in the right direction into the chaos. The mind moves from one thing to another thing to another thing, like a monkey swinging through the forest. Grabs one branch, lets go, grabs another branch, lets go, grabs another branch. This is all conscious life. It's not because you think too much. It's not because your mind is jumping around. It's because you've left it behind the storage that organize your universe. And now you're seeing pure phenomenology, what's actually there, what's actually being perceived from moment to moment. This kind of meditation is different to just raw experiencing, right? Because you're not just focusing the attention on the breath and trying to hold it there. You're not trying to create this one particular meditation experience. You're starting to see the nature of what is actually there how your mind, how your consciousness actually works. Whatever the mind lands on, that's attention. You're paying attention to that thing. 
Right now you're paying attention to me. You could pay attention to this Buddha statue, green. Did you notice it was green before I mentioned it? It's right there in front of you. If you didn't put attention onto it, you wouldn't notice. So where attention goes, feeling sparks up. You like it or you dislike it or you feel neutral. This is what is called dependent origination. Paticca samupada. Where attention lands, you spark up this reaction of liking and disliking, wanting or not wanting, attachment or non-attachment, becoming conscious engagement with the object. 99% of your life is spent consciously engaged with objects that you like or dislike. You ignore the ones you feel neutral about. Did you ever comment to somebody how your ear feels? Can you feel your ear? Do you like it or dislike it? But you've commented to people about your headache or your bad back. Or you've commented to people how nice your stomach feels when you eat some nice brown bread or durian or guitio, whatever it is. Because almost all of your attention follows liking and disliking. We pay attention. When attention lands on something, then you get this reaction of liking and disliking. You are drawn naturally into objects where attention goes. So be careful where you put attention. If you put our attention onto things that generate or stimulate greed, anger or delusion, you will become greedy, angry or deluded. If you put attention into places that stimulate compassion, forgiveness, mindfulness, then you will become more compassionate, forgiving, and mindful. It's a straightforward psychodynamic mechanism. It's not that you're a good person or a bad person, it's because of where you put attention. This is why vampires... <laughs> when a vampire bites you, you become a vampire, right? Don't laugh. This is serious stuff. Vampires mean bad qualities. You can't have a bad quality and not be a person of that bad quality. You can't be angry but be a nice person. You can't be greedy but be a non-greedy person. When that thing bites you, you become it. That was the meaning of vampires. Vampires can only come into your house if you invite them. Bad qualities only come into your heart and your mind if you invite them in. There's always a point of choice to choose carefully where you put attention. Mindfulness should bring daylight. Vampires don't like daylight. So, first step, conceptual universe. Second step, out of the conceptual universe into raw experiencing. Third step, out of raw experiencing on particular objects and just mindful of the way consciousness grabs one thing after another thing after another thing. Final stage, what happens if your attention stops going out to anything? This was how the Buddha actually described meditation. He said, when the eye lands on an object of form, eye consciousness arises. Do not get caught or involved in that I consciousness, or unwholesome states will invade your mind. He dwells with restraint regarding the I sense. When the ear hears a sound with attention, hearing consciousness arises. If you get caught in that hearing consciousness by paying attention to its signs and features, unwholesome states will invade the mind. He dwells with restraint regarding the ear sense. He dwells with restraint regarding the body sense, the tongue sense, the nose sense, and the mind sense, thinking. Because ideas occur and your attention goes to the idea, just like something happens and your eye goes to look at, somebody comes in through the door, you, go, you look at them, right? Somebody makes a sound behind you, your ear goes to the hearing consciousness always ju moving, jumping around. What happens if your mind doesn't go out to attend to anything? That was the exact way that the Buddha taught meditation. 
you hold yourself in restraint. If you want to look it up, this is called guarding the sense doors. It's a very simple, straightforward, clear formula. So what happens? First of all, you'll fall asleep because you've got nothing to entertain you, nothing to put attention onto. Uh, it will feel dull because, well, if my attention is not going to anything, where is it? It's like, zzz. But after a while, you start to know yourself apart from what you are attending to. This sense of I am rather than I am this or I am that. Just that sense of raw consciousness before consciousness has landed on any object. This is quite important because there is in meditation certain states that arise when you lose the sense of self. You go into an expanded consciousness and it's kind of oozy and woozy and there's not much happening and it's kind of peaceful. You might be awake, you might not be awake. feels like spaciousness and I've disappeared. That's falling asleep while you're sitting. That's not the direction of meditation. It's not a bad sign if you've done this and do this. But it is a dead end. And I want to make that clear because nobody made it clear to me. And I spent years tinkering around with this. Zing. I could even do it walking around. It's like... <laughs> My self has gone. Consciousness intensifies. The sense of self intensifies. This word intensification is really important, indicative. Consciousness gathers. The Buddha used this word. He said it gathers, it centers, and it unifies. It becomes bright. Not lights, because that's the eye, but becomes bright. There's also a feeling of power, powerfulness that comes through the body. You are not sleeping. The body will sit awake and like, oh, this is really real. This is really present. This is not anything to do with that conceptual world that I live in. Attention is sustained and guarded, number one. It's called applied and sustained attention. Number two, there's bitti, rapture. An energization comes through the body that's not pleasant as in a nice food or listening to Betty Davis, Rapture. Do you know Betty Davis? Not the actress, the, the, the funk singer. It's not the rapture or the happiness that comes from sense contact. Something nice to eat, hear, smell, taste, touch, think about. Those are sense pleasures. This is the rapture that arises when the mind isn't activating any of the senses. And consciousness comes together and it's bright and it's strong, it's powerful. It's controlled, and then this rapture will come through the body. Was stage part two, then stage three was a happiness. Sukha arises. Again, a sukha, not because of sense pleasure or sensory contact. Consciousness by itself is perfectly self-satisfied. Consciousness on its own is purified and it's happy. It doesn't need anything added to it. But because we live outside in the conceptual world, it's hard to experience. I'm mentioning these things. These are not practices. These are things that start to arise after you've been doing practices in the right way. And I'm mentioning them because nobody mentioned them to me when I was practicing. So for many years, I missed it. So I'm talking about it so that if and when you see and experience these things, you're like, oh, that's right. Because this consciousness is you, it appears not as something magical and mystical and fantastical. It's something that feels ordinary, feels familiar, because it is your own consciousness, but purified of not sensory consciousness. So sukha, and then the third one, equanimity, or an equipoise that arises from the mind not being scattered. Now there is in the suttas listed an equanimity that arises when the mind is scattered. So you've had something nice to eat, you're in a nice comfortable chair and you're sat back and you 
you've got the phone in your hand and you've got Facebook going and you've got a cup of tea and the cat on your lap. And, you know, that's a kind of equanimity, right? But the mind is scattered, moving around. In Buddhist terminology, it's called papancha. So, nipapancha, when the mind is not scattered, not moving around, that's the equanimity that I call equipoise, because the mind is, like, pinpoint clear, sharp, like crystal clear. These were called uh, jhana experiences or concentration experiences, but please note that you are not concentrating on an object. This is consciousness as it becomes purified. So this is this trek out of the conceptual world. These experiences then are not no more concepts. They're not new ideas. You've left that world long behind. So I will finish right now with the title that I call this talk, The Long Withdrawing Roar. Did anybody look up the poem? You didn't do any homework at all? I'm not much of a, I don't, I don't get off on poems. I'm not so much. So this particular poem called Dover Beach, you can look it up if you want. I don't get off on poems. But he had this fantastic, beautiful concept in the poem. He was bemoaning the lack of faith in the modern generation. And he's saying that faith in Christianity and God is withdrawing. Like the waves on the beach pick up the pebbles and throw the pebbles. And it has this great roaring sound of the beach. But as the tide withdraws, the roar doesn't get less. It's just as strong as it always was but it's more distant, so you can't hear it or experience it in the same way. And he said that was the retreat of Christianity, of religion, that it's just as strong and as powerful as it always was, but it's retreated and it's gone a long way from us. So I had that image in my mind, this long, the melancholy, long withdrawing roar. Is to my mind that conceptual world that world of stories that we live in. You don't fix it. You don't solve it. You don't get new concepts to beat down your old concepts. And now you've got a nicer, better world. You have left that roaring world long behind as you go into the mystic path. So that's what I was thinking of. The melancholy, long withdrawing roar. It takes some courage because that's where you are familiar right? When you sit and you've got five minutes or you're in a car and you're in the journey and what happens? Your mind immediately gets lost in that world. We go back to it time and time again, even though it's not so wholesome, depending on how well you've constructed your world. I have a really nasty, stupid joke. Can I tell you? It's a really dumb joke and I don't particularly find it funny, but it makes a point it really it makes a really good point. It's about a rabbit in a in the animal testing laboratory. And one day it escapes and it goes out to the field and it sees some ordinary rabbits and it's like what are you doing? And the rabbit's well, we're running around. He's like, This is amazing, I didn't know we could run around. He says, What's this stuff? And the rabbits go, Well, that's grass. Because this is amazing. And he says, what, what are these rabbits? Like, oh, these are, these are does. These are female rabbits. This is fantastic. So he has a really good afternoon out with these rabbits. And then he says, anyway, like, thanks for showing me around, but I'm going to get back to the laboratory. And the natural rabbit said, why are you going back? He says, well, I'm dying for a cigarette. <laughs> I can't believe you laughed. <laughs> but really, I think about this. When I practice hard, monks aren't supposed to talk about our own practice, but I'm going to anyway. I'm too old to care about these things now. When I practice really hard and I touch on this purified consciousness, it's so obvious. It's so clean and purified and fulfilling. And like when you're there, you're like, oh yeah, that stuff doesn't matter. And then what do you do? You, you go back for a cigarette in the laboratory. 
you, you go back to this conceptual world again and sit there thinking. And it's because it's familiar, because that's where you spent a lifetime constructing that world. It's challenged from all these different places, so you keep updating your constructs to try and make yourself comfortable. There is this completely other thing, and that's what we are doing on the mystic path.